Between it being a joint service and us having sprung forward last night, the service is both earlier and later than we feared it should be. Welcome all. Welcome especially to Judy Roberts and Laura Black from Methodist Mission. Uh, Laura, as you know, is the Kaihatu or director. Judy is, has many responsibilities, uh, but is the principal person in terms of fundraising. She'll read and share a reflection with us later this morning. Today is a service in which we celebrate the work of the mission and its connection to the parish and to parishes elsewhere in the region. I'd like to welcome you all. I'd like to welcome those two watching on YouTube. Any news or notices we need to share before we begin? Ken. Neither a combined meeting is the place to bring up the church hall, but I will carry on. Or here. Yes. <laughs> Uh, you might be aware, you may not be, that the consent, building consent was granted last Friday and subsequently to that we paid the bill of $9,300 for the consent and the bill, the physical, well I don't know if it's a physical, but the consent has been up uh, uplifted by Feldspar, so progress is underway and um, the plan is to uh, commence work in roughly three to four weeks. Um, our tenants have to move out and they've been advised and they've both got locations to move to. And in the meantime we have to get the thing repriced by stewards because there were various changes according to the building consent. So that has to be finalised and hopefully that will come in within the amount that we've been approved by head office. <laughs> allowing for the little bit of contingency that's fluctuating in the thing, so progress is underway. The main impact which we haven't resolved at the moment is um, the church should be available, but we've obviously got to figure out once they start building, we won't be able to go onto the 
pool, what we're going to do for refreshments. And at this stage, I haven't got any suggestions. <laughs> so um, those of you who are good thinkers, maybe we can... We will have toilets. That's the first priority, of course, is to make sure that there's toilet facilities for using the church. But uh, how we're going to have the hot drink and things afterwards, at this stage, haven't quite figured out. However, we'll work on it and... Um, we have electricity, <laughs> and we have cups and things, so we might as well just move everything in the office for a, few, for a while and somehow manage that, accessing water from I don't know where. So I haven't got any solutions at the moment, but just to, that's the main thing we need to probably figure out as a congregation how we're going to deal with over the next fear of what construction is underway. Anyway, it looks like it will be progressing. And on the other hand, the beam replacement, so that beam there, and the one that's vertical at the back have to be replaced. There's an insurance claim of $17,000. How can I have a reply from Stuart Construction about the street for timber required? So there's no pro nothing reporting on that other than that will progress. And while that's happening, we won't be able to use the church for that alone, hopefully be for one Sunday next month. Anyway, that's the update that I can give you on the building project. Or project, for a minute. Oh, sorry, the other thing is Bruce has been working hard to figure out how we can get the words from your service sheet onto our YouTube transmissions. So today's test day. So we're trying to uh, at least have the words to the hymns going out to our people so they can follow the hymns as we sing them through. Um, and we are working on that to try and refine that. Um, we'll have an act of after June, please. Anything else we need to share and say before we continue? We are reflecting today this religious experience doesn't count for much unless it needs to engagement with the other to doing good. That's very much at the heart of Wesley's teaching. I'm going to begin with uh, a poem by Kate Michael Hager, which reminds us of this. Let silence be placed around us like a mandrake. Let us enter into it as through a small secret door stooping to emerge into a garden, stooping to emerge into an acre of peace where stillness reigns and God is ever present. Then comes the voice of God and the startled cry of a refugee child waking in unfamiliar surroundings. Then comes the voice of God and the mother, fleeing with her treasure in her arms and saying, I am here. Then comes the voice of God and the Father, who points to the stars and says, There is our signpost. There is our answer. Be of good courage. God be with you. And with you also. Hold hands, people of God, in love. Find the house together in God's grace. Peter, the reminders 
this religion of Christianity is process of bringing in is occluding. The translation is the egalitarian translation, which is the best of both the Catholic and Jewish scholars to use scripture where gendered language is, is moderated as much as possible, and language based on hierarchy. You, however, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a people set apart to sing the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into the wonderful divine light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once there was no mercy for you, now you found mercy. Our first hymn is by Susan Jones, the love writer, to a tune we use often for another hymn. And I'll just read the first verse. It is, Let us reach down deep inside us. Let us reach down deep inside us to the place where quiet reigns. Find self who lives inside us, knows our joy and knows our pains. Let our ego stand aside their shadow sharing space with light. Let our inner selves rejoice as the candle shines in the darkest night. <laughs> Prejudices 
the pursuit of justice often requires great courage. We are people who have received gift upon gift, an abundance in full measure. Some share in the divine generosity, the very giving of God. In giving and receiving, in our sharing and endeavour, in our listening to and enacting the way of Jesus, we find there is enough, enough life and dignity, hope and meaning. Mercy that leads us. We praise the giving one, the generous spirit, the outpouring God, who wills that there is enough. We challenge ourselves to live in the generosity of God, to not be afraid there is not enough, but to trust there can be, offering what we can, and trust that others will give it to. Where we struggle to find this difficult, we resolve to be courageous and to act differently, to be people of open hearts and minds. Hence, this is our resolve, and this is our prayer. A few years ago, I, I had to, I chose to write a thesis on the relationship between Methodist missions and Methodist churches. I found this quote, which I had in my mind by John Wesley, of course. One great reason why the rich in general have so little sympathy for the poor is because they so seldom visit them. Hence it is that according to the common observation, one part of the world does not know what the other suffers. Many of them do not know because they do not care to know. They keep out of the way of knowing it and then plead their bulgy ignorances as an excuse for their heartless part. Indeed, sir, said a person of large substance, I am a very compassionate man, but to tell you the truth, I do, not know, I do not know anybody in the world to say they want. How did this come to pass? Why? He took good care to keep out of their way, and if he fell upon them unawares, he passed over on the other side. May we step outside our narrow circles of those who believe and live like us. May we reach out, befriend, hear the other, and the with them find our common ground. Amen. I'd like to say to be Jesus' paraphrase of the Lord's Prayer. Eternal Spirit, earth painter, pain bearer, life giver, source of all the tears of the shall Father, who loves us all, to thy God, who is in heaven, and thou will be your name and echo in the universe. Where your justice be done by all created beings, you will come to our peace and freedom, sustain our hope and come on earth. For the bread and meat of today, feed us, and the mercy of us all for one another, forgive us. For the bread and meat of today, feed us.
turns the gratitude towards the setting sun and the gentle, gentle folding of each day. May this be a quiet time, a time of renewal and healing for ourselves and your beloved creation. Amen. Our second hymn is from for singing number 17. The alternative version of everyone born a place at the table. This is the first verse. Everyone born a place at the table. Everyone born to water, bread, shelter, space, a safe place for growing. Everyone born a star of the head. And a God who dies to bring no creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. It's a God who dies to bring no creators of justice, justice and joy.
this morning, but before you read, Julie, can I check, do we want to have the read of the Fijian as well? We don't, great, so Julie will read first, then if you'd like to read afterwards. A reading from Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The second reading is from Mark chapter 5, verses 25 to 34. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of the many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus looked around, kept looking around, to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, and be free from your suffering. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.
And now the singing group will sing, sing a happy hallelujah.
And mind is not alone amongst the prophets. There's a recurring theme that ritual, devotion, and light praise are empty, repellent even, if they don't interact with justice, inclusion, and hospitality. And John Wesley would say, I meant to that. He was marked by an intense spiritual life. Yet having holiness was social. If you were nurtured by the sacred, this was by investing care for the poor, the sick, the prisoner. He was to his first followers to an intense spiritual life of prayer and Bible, but just as much to visit the sick, the poor, and the prisoner, and to acts that alleviate their suffering. Some are jumped from the Jewish prophets to John Wesley. What of oh, Jesus? Well, that's where the gospel story comes in. Here was a woman who was undone. She'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years. This is a fairly terse statement, hiding the world of pain. What goes with that bleeding? The discomfort. The struggle to keep clean, feeling ill, run down, all of which is bad enough, but there was more. She was an outcast. Menstruation made a woman ritually unclean. Even now, in Orthodox Jewish households, a woman on a period would sleep apart from her husband and avoid all physical contact with him, and afterwards has to undergo ritual immersion. So this woman was unclean, weary, sick, struggling to survive. And in other versions of the story, we hear she spent everything she had on doctors to no avail, so we imagine she was destitute. So here she is, desperate, but holding on to the shred of hope. If I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. She does. She is. He notices as if someone's power is grabbed from him. He asks, who touched him? She, trembling with fear, tells him she did and tells him why. This was potentially a dangerous moment. For her, women did not touch men outside of their families, even the head of their own. But anyone she touches is made ritually unclean. She had been met with anger, even violence. She was not. He told her faith had made her well, she was to go in peace. Why have we chosen this week? Because it stands for all the stories of Jesus healing people. Time and again, Jesus heals. But it's so much more than a sick person to make better than going home. Each of his people were isolated by their sickness. A woman with a hemorrhage. A man blind from birth whose disability was an object lesson as a supposed to sin by him or his parents. The leper confined by his status to the very edge of society. Healing wasn't just to make him better. It was restoring the person in the community. There's also for me, at the heart of the story, an act of self-belief, an assertion of self-worth. This woman reaches out for what she needs to be made whole. She claims her own healing. And this mission still stands in the tradition of Methodist social engagement going back to John Wesley. Though I think it was struggle to imagine the context in which the work here happens. And the best tradition of that work, just as some kind of beneficence from the enlightened, the fortunate, and the virtuous, the less fortunate folk, it is rooted in partnership, which begins with the client's self belief and the possibility of transition to a better and fuller life. The mission helps them claim that, and we stand with them. At this point,
is there anyone who does not know the Mishnah and what we do? And who doesn't get my monthly emails? I'll see you after. <laughs> um, we deliver evidence-based support for a wide range of services, including early childhood care, youth transition housing, literacy programs, and so much more. All designed to help individuals and families thrive in our community. Today's focus is on mission, hospitality, and inclusion. And the mission's vision is of a safe, caring, and sustainable society where everyone is valued and respected. I feel we at the mission, he and the other, as David spoke of earlier. I quote Marie Nolan, hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place, unquote. This idea is central to everything we do at the mission. We don't try to change people, but we create an environment where change can flourish and come from within. As David said, Methodist Mission Southern has been working to improve social outcomes since 1890, and we remain committed to our purpose statement, change that works. We now support and challenge for you to risk a better future. And that's on our way now. <laughs> The Mission's work embodies this principle of hospitality in action. We actively create spaces where people can not only find refuge, but start to rebuild their lives and discover their potential as an early transition houses and young mum's house, which provide not just a place to stay, but a real home. Recently, we've seen the incredible growth in our entire Some are working towards their driver's licenses. Others are entertaining employment, or entering employment, or education, and one resident has even graduated from a leadership program. Our residents have had opportunities to participate in confidence building courses, with horses, sorry, I meant that rhymes, gym memberships, and even road trips to pick strawberries. They've also taken part in the self defense course, helping them feel more empowered and secure in their day to day lives. And this is from uh, funding from Sport Aotearoa who I'm trying to educate on how to help disadvantage youth. The young mums have started cooking and sharing meals together, even meal planning around grocery days, showing great teamwork and building strong connections. An example of how practical support can foster emotional resilience with providing swimming lessons for their babies, ensuring their next generation is safe and confident in water. Many of these young mums have never stepped inside a swimming pool before, so we book them talks allowing them to join their babies in water. And these are everyday experiences who you expect most families have, but our youth have not. These experiences are more than just activities, they're acts of hospitality, fostering a sense of dignity, empowerment and belonging in each person. This hospitality goes beyond meeting basic needs. It's about providing a supportive environment that nurtures their well-being so they are lifted up and are supported to stay lifted, developing resilience to overcome whatever they have and replacing it with a positive future. In each of our transition houses, we have a Taitira Hapore, who is a community support worker. We have Susie here in Dunedin, and she, supports, she also supports our ECE Little Citizens families and Ruby and the cargo. Both work with transition house residents, co-design personal support plans around each youth's goals and what they want to do with their lives, and how we can support them to get there. This year we've been busy incorporating physical activity as part of daily life in the houses. As we all know, active bodies create active minds, reduce anxiety and stress, and create the resilience to negate the curveballs of life. While housing and education are crucial, we also know that small practical acts of support, like helping a single parent maintain their rental property, can make all the difference in someone's journey to stability. Our sustained tenancies team, Tammy Lee and Megan, exemplify this hands on support, helping individuals facing increasingly complex challenges. Whether they are families, refugees, immigrants, or those managing difficult living situations, a recent client, she was a single parent to, the new, to, to New Zealand, was just struggling to make ends meet. We provided a long mail to avoid a tenancy breach and essential items for their baby. 
to those families striving and secure in their little home, showing how practical assistance can lead to long-term stability. Our hospitality even extends to the environment. The mission is committed to environmental sustainability. It plans to fund um, funding, or well, I'm trying to find funding, to install solar panels at our employees transition houses and young mum's house. With nine teenagers, um, babies and toddlers, you can imagine the power of this. This ensures that we, we care for creation while reducing our environmental footprint, showing that hospitality isn't just for today, but for generations to come. At Little Citizens Childcare here in Dunedin, we see hospitality in a different form, encouraging our Tamariki to explore the world through sensory play, art and music. In our Kiwi room, Tamariki were involved in the Tigers Poly Fest this year and did an amazing performance with white and mouse, and it was super cute. So I don't know if anyone saw that, did you? I would also like to mention podcast series I did over this past year, which was a series of eight or nine interviews on all I came, where I talked to each of our service teams and they discussed their work for the mission. And Gloria joined me in the last time about the mission overall, its past, present, and future, which I thoroughly recommend listening to. You can find these on our YouTube channel, and it's also on our website on the supporters page. In every act of service, whether through housing, physical, and mental health support, or helping people reconnect with their cultural heritage, mission mirrors the biblical call to welcome the stranger. The Greek word philodosinia combines two ideas, love for people connected by kinship or faith, who you know, and love for the stranger, within us. This is more than just being nice or offering a cup of tea, although we all know that that not be enough to the is most important. It's, truly welcome, it's about truly welcoming others into our lives and our hearts. Philodosinos the love of the stranger. It's a good question to ask ourselves, how much room do we make in our hearts for others? Your support of the mission is part of this wider effort to extend kindness and hospitality to those who need it most. The stories I've shared today reflect the incredible journeys of the people we work with. The Mornington Mosque and Women's Fellowships are wonderful supporters and kindly listen, listen to my captain on about the mission every month. Last week I shared about funding for TR Māori resources for our young people to connect with their father. Rediscovering their identities as most of them are working in the transition house because of the disconnection with the family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that my time up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Und dann schenken wir Offering.
Christ, my Lord Jesus Christ.